really happy to present our newest research on social change and cultural evolution, and particularly happy to be contributing to IACCP's Golden Jubilee celebration. My presentation is titled Culture Change in the Pandemic, Adapting to Survival Threat and Small-Scale Social Environments. So here's my roadmap. I'm going to start with my observations and experiences that generated the studies, then my theoretical framework, and then empirical studies on shifts in concerns, activities, values, and parenting in the United States during the pandemic, then cross-cultural findings, and um, finally, a study of shifts in communication modalities and their effect on well being, and then very finally, uh, conclusions. So now I start with my observations and experiences that generated the studies. But I'm going to start my uh, COVID research story, not in the United States, but in Nabanchauk, a Maya community in Chiapas, Mexico. Doing research in uh, Navanchoke in 1969, I observed that at that time, the community was isolated from the outside world. It was a very small scale social environment. Material resources were very limited. Lifespans were short. Infant mortality was high and mortality was highly salient. To adapt to this dangerous environment with limited resources, there were elaborate death rituals. Death was a very salient part of life. Here's a photo of Day of the Dead in the community cemetery. This family has fed the soul of this woman's late father by putting lots of food on his grave. They coped with and adapted to these conditions by growing their own food. This young girl is harvesting corn. They cope by weaving clothing for themselves and other family members. Another uh, factor, another uh, situation that was uh, common for children was that children were expected to contribute to family maintenance. Here, teenage girls on the right are making tortillas for the extended family. They're working with an older family member on the left. Besides showing young people contributing to family subsistence, this slide shows family cooperation and intergenerational collaboration. All of these characteristics are features of a subsistence ecology. When I returned to this Maya community in 1991, after an absence of 21 years, I found the results of tremendous social change. The economy had shifted from subsistence agriculture to commerce. Material resources were therefore more plentiful and behavior had shifted to adapt to the new ecology. Family members were more independent, less collectivistic and interdependent in their behavior. Their social networks had widened beyond the family and community. Subsistence activities like growing corn were greatly reduced and some clothing was being purchased rather than being woven at home. Another adaptation to the new commercial environment was that the authority of the older generation based on controlling agricultural land was greatly reduced. Observing adaptation to social change in Nabanchauk stimulated me to develop a theory of social change, cultural evolution, and human development. One tenet of the theory was that cultural and behavioral adaptation to social and ecological change, that is cultural evolution, is bi-directional. This means that cultural movement toward that of the Nabanchao community and ecologies in which humans evolved 
um, or in the opposite direction toward that of our modern commercial ecology is possible at any given time and depends on the socio-demographic features present in the ecology. The most relevant socio-demographic features for the present research are mortality rate, resource scarcity, and small-scale social environment. We were able to test the basic idea of bi-directionality in the United States by examining survey data from the 1970s up through the Great Recession of 2009. Our research showed that in times of greater national wealth, young people in the United States became more independent in their cultural values and more interested in becoming rich. In contrast, in times of economic retraction, especially in the Great Recession, they became more interdependent in their values and less interested in becoming rich. In times of greater national wealth, they also became less concerned about having enough money to satisfy basic needs and their conservation values became weaker. In contrast, in times of economic retraction, they became more concerned about having enough money to satisfy basic needs and their conservation values became stronger. This research confirmed the basic theoretical point that opposite directions of ecological change produce opposite directions of cultural and psychological change. Lesser wealth is one component of a subsistence ecology. However, my theory posits that adaptation to all components of a subsistence ecology produce similar cultural values, concerns, and behaviors. Two other components of a subsistence ecology most relevant to the ecological change produced by COVID were increased mortality and retraction of the social world under lockdown. We therefore expected that these ecological change would lead to similar cultural and behavioral outcomes as reduced wealth. This theory development and research on the cultural and individual effects of social change in Nabanchok and the United States provided a framework to understand shifts I began to observe locally during the pandemic. The pandemic became a natural experiment for the study of cultural evolution and its behavioral manifestations. The next two slides show the parallels between the subsistence way of life I first observed in Nabanchok in 1969 and shifts in our society during the pandemic. As people began to die from COVID, death became more salient in our society. Here in a photo from the Los Angeles Times, a family is grieving over a coffin of someone who has died from COVID. Pictures of dead bodies and funerals became very common. Death became more a part of life here as it had been in Nabanchok. As this started to happen, I began to personally experience and observe behavioral shifts going on locally, but pushing behavior in the direction of life in Nabanchok and other subsistence villages, other, other subsistence communities around the world. I started a vegetable garden for the very first time, something I had had absolutely no interest in at any point before the pandemic. Here I am in my front yard in Venice, California, harvesting lettuce during the pandemic. Like Maya women who weave, I went back to our cultural form of weaving, that is knitting. During the pandemic, my granddaughter, who had never shown interest in cooking, began baking bread for the family. Her bread making activities were usually in collaboration with a member of the older generation, her dad, shown in a reflected image. All of the changes I was observing were predicted by my pre-existing theory of social change, cultural evolution, and human development. 
So I wondered whether these local personal and family changes could be more widespread. I suspected that these shifts were a universal response to increased mortality threat and the narrowing of the social world under stay at home orders. So with my collaborators, I carried out studies about the effects of COVID on values, concerns, and behavior. Let me now turn and say a bit about my theoretical framework and how it organizes the behavioral predictions in the studies I'm going to talk about. Here you can see that the theory of social change, cultural evolution, and human development has multiple levels. The levels which will form today's framework are ecology, cultural values, adult behavior, and child learning environment. The labels are the major concepts. The arrows show the links between the concepts. They also show relationships that are relevant to the studies on the pandemic I'm going to present. Ecology is posited to be the major causal influence. Ecological concepts central to our COVID research are, as I've mentioned before, increased mortality and the narrowing of the social world to the household unit. The vertical arrows show the primary direction of influence. The red oval encircles one pathway of influence, that is, ecology influences behavior. Another way of looking at the same relationship is to say that behavior is adapted to the ecological environment. Here is an alternative pathway of influence. The red oval circles the pathway from ecology to cultural values, which in turn influence adult behavior. There's another way to think about this pathway. Cultural values are adapted to the ecological environment and behavior expresses a particular set of cultural values. These values are in turn expressed in the learning environment adults provide for children, thus influencing the next generation. Let me now apply these levels to social change in the pandemic. In this way, I've transformed informal observations into theory-based predictions about the pandemic. The basic idea was that as the environment shifted in the direction of a subsistence ecology with increased survival threat and narrowing of the social world, those shifts would elicit corresponding adaptations on all the levels in this chart. I'm going to start with the ecological level. In the pandemic, mortality increased, creating further ecological change, stay-at-home orders led to a smaller scale and more self-contained social world. The increase in mortality led to the prediction that survival concern, mortality salience would increase. We predicted that these ecological changes would produce shifts downstream on lower levels of this diagram, cultural values, adult behavior, and child learning environment. The theory predicted that values would become more collectivistic and that subsistence values, such as conserving, conserving scarce resources would become stronger. The theory also predicted an increase in subsistence activities that authority would come to be more accepted and that family members would become more interdependent. We also predicted that greater family interdependence would reverberate on the level of child learning environment. More specifically, that parents would increase their expectations for children to contribute to family maintenance, the subsistence tasks of the home. To test these hypotheses and understand what changed in the pandemic, we carried out a set of empirical studies. The first two studies were in the United States. 
These studies focus on shifts in concerns, activities, values, and parenting in the US. And the first study is a large scale survey. The survey research was based on large scale surveys in California and Rhode Island administered about a month after stay at home orders were given in each state. The online research was a national study of Google searches and social media comparing online behavior before the pandemic with behavior during the early days of the pandemic. The survey reveals people's subjective experience of shifts during the early days of the pandemic. The study of Google searches and social media is a natural or quasi experiment in design. It reveals behavioral shifts during the early days of the pandemic. You will see that the findings of the two studies using two different methodologies reinforce and complement each other. Here's an outline of methods used in the survey research in the US. Our sample was about 1,000 participants in each of two United States, California and Rhode Island. Included in this sample was a subsample of 257 parents with children 7 to 18 years of age who were living at home. We asked respondents questions about their experience of shifts in life during the pandemic about a month after stay at home started in their respective states. The parent subsample also answered specific questions about changes in parenting during the pandemic. Factor analysis was used to identify component items for five concepts mortality salience, subsistence activities, subsistence values, family interdependence, and cultural tightness. Bootstrap t-tests were used to identify significant shifts in these areas. Structural equation modeling was used to explore causal effects of the two ecological var variables shifts in mortality salience conceived to be a function of actual mortality and number of days of stay at home reported by each participant. T-tests and regression were used to analyze shifts in technologically mediated communication, the last study, and their effects on well-being. During COVID, Mortality became a more salient concern for people in both California and Rhode Island. As the upward red arrow indicates, people in both states reported thinking significantly more about their own death and about family members dying. They reported thinking more about concrete plans for when they die or when family members die. For example, making a will where they would like to be buried. Subsistence activities such as growing vegetables also increased. In both states, people reported they were doing this significantly more than before the pandemic. Other subsistence activities also increased significantly. In both states, many people reported they were cooking more. In both states, many people reported they had increased their home maintenance activities. As a whole, the reported increase in subsistence activities, growing vegetables, cooking, and home maintenance was statistically significant at the 0.001 level with a large effect size. Factor analysis re revealed a group of items we labeled subsistence values. All of these are stronger values in a subsistence ecology than in a commercial ecology. This factor consisted of not wasting scarce resources, high importance of having enough money to satisfy basic needs such as food and shelter, low importance of becoming rich, high importance, high appreciation of family, and high appreciation of the elderly. 
As predicted on theoretical grounds, people in both states judged that this group of values had become significantly more important during the pandemic. Another variable identified in the factor analysis was the acceptability of government restricting respondents' movement and the movement of others. This is what Michelle Gelfond and, co and colleagues call cultural tightness. Acceptability of government restriction also increased significantly in both states. Factor analysis divided family interdependence into three sets of items, family activities, respondent providing help to family, and respondent receiving help from family. Family activities consisted of eating and talking together. Help was both practical and social. As predicted on theoretical grounds, respondents in both states judged all three types of family interdependence to have increased significantly during the pandemic. Well, these are the shifts, but what about contextual or ecological influences? A structural equation model shown in the next slide addressed this question. This slide shows the significant relationships identified in the structural equation model. To make this complex model clearer, I have removed the coefficients on the links and the components of the latent variables, but this information is provided in our publication. As I predicted on theoretical grounds, two variables representing ecological factors predict all the other shifts experienced during the pandemic. We see increased mortality salience as a reflection of the actual increased mortality produced by COVID-19. The red lines in the slide show that the experience of increased mortality salience predicts all the other shifts experienced during the pandemic. We see number of days of stay at home as a measure of the narrowing of the social world to the household, most often the family household. The black lines show that number of days of stay at home predicts almost all the same shifts predicted by mortality salience. However, there's one more form of family interdependence and it was addressed in the subsample of parents with children living at home. Our parents subsample showed that during the pandemic, parents expected more help from their children at home. In both states, many parents reported increased expectations that their children would help with cooking for the family, cleaning common areas in the family home, and helping with family laundry. This was another form of family interdependence that increased during the pandemic. Parents shifted the learning environment of their children towards helping with subsistence tasks at home rather than focusing exclusively on schoolwork. Now let me move to the online research and our quasi-experiment. For the online research, we did a national study of Google searches and social media. Whereas the survey focused on people's subjective experience of change in response to survey questions, this study compared actual behavior before the pandemic with actual behavior during the pandemic. Also, whereas the last study focused on two states, this study used a national sample. As you will see, the shifts in objectively measured behavior reinforced the prior study of subjective experience. Using the big data search tool, TalkWalker, we studied spontaneous online behavior on Twitter, blogs, and internet forums, and we also studied Google searches. We compared the frequency of theory relevant terms posted on the internet during 70 days before the pandemic with the frequency of the same terms posted during the first 70 days of the pandemic. This is truly big data. 
Our data set consists of more than a half billion data points. The combined usage rates of the internet media that were studied were so high that this was essentially a population level analysis. As I mentioned earlier, the reports of people's experiences in the survey, which I just told you about, were confirmed by their spontaneous behavior online. In Google searches and social media, mentions of the terms survive, cemetery, fear of death, death and bury shot up during the 70 days after Trump's emergency COVID declaration. For example, the phrase fear of death increased by 115% on Twitter. The increase in mortality related terms increased significantly across Google searches, Twitter, blogs, and internet forums with a large effect size in all media. Significance level is so great that there's only a chance of one in one billion that this rise in mortality salience happened by chance. The reported increase in subsistence activities during COVID in the survey study was reinforced by spontaneous behavior online. In Google searches and social media, these shifts towards more subsistence activities in the areas of gardening, food preparation, and home improvement were, as predicted by my theory, effect sizes were huge. Reported increases in interdependent behavior and appreciation of family found in the survey was reinforced and supported on the level of cultural values by a large increase in uh, collectivistic words during the pandemic. The frequency of the collectivistic group of words share, help, give and sacrifice significantly increased in Google searches and across all three social media platforms with large effect sizes. So now I move to our cross-cultural findings and I'm gonna start with the replication of our survey in Turkey. We use the same survey as in the United States it was translated and culturally adapted by our collaborator, Nefel Boz in Turkey. On the 16th of March, the Minister of the Interior in Turkey ordered businesses and places of worship to halt indoor activities. With that announcement, more than 80 million people in Turkey started to live under some form of restrictions to their movements and trains and public transit came to a halt nationwide. So the data collection period from September 1, 2020 through May 31, 2021 was uh, later in the pandemic than in the United States. The sample in Turkey numbered 337. All the shifts during the pandemic in Turkey replicated the shifts we found in our US study. Mortality salient, subsistence values, subsistence activities, family helping respondent, respondent helping family, uh, acceptance of government restrictions and family interdependence. All of these increased in Turkey during the pandemic. But again, as in the United States, we wanted to identify the contextual or ecological influences. Structural equation modeling shown in the next two slides again address this question. Because we had a much smaller sample in Turkey than in the United States, we had to make simpler models. And so we separated the effects of mortality salience and number of days of stay at home into two separate models. And here's the model uh, using mortality salience. Again, we see mortality salience as a stand-in for actual COVID mortality. 
Uh, for purposes of clarity, the coefficients relating to the latent variables aren't shown. Here you can see that overall increases in mortality salience predict increases in the other variables as in the United States, and the fit of the model to the data is adequate. Thus, we've replicated our model from the United States. The individual links from increased mortality salience to increased acceptance of government restriction, increased subsistence activities, increased subsistence values, and increased help provided by the respondents to their families are statistically significant. Number of days of stay at home is our measure of the shrinking of the social world. This model links number of days of stay at home to the dependent variables. Again, the components of the latent variables have been eliminated in the uh, slide for purposes of clarity. Because many participants did not fill in how many days they had been isolating, we had a greatly reduced sample for this model. Nonetheless, the overall model had adequate fit and one individual link from number of days of stay at home to increased acceptance of government restriction um, uh, reached statistical uh, uh, significance. We also replicated in Turkey the shifts in parental expectations. To a statistically significant extent, Turkish parents increased their expectations for their children to contribute to their own subsistence needs, and they increased their expectations for their children to contribute to the subsistence tasks of the home. So now I'm going to talk about our cross-cultural study of the pandemic behavior um, online and where we are replicating the quasi-experiment in Indonesia, Mexico, and Japan. So this is a cross-cultural study of the United States, Indonesia, Mexico, and Japan. We include the United States because we had a shorter time frame in the other countries than we had had in our uh, original online study. And we wanted to test replication of results using the same time frame in each of the four countries. We again used the big data search tool, um, TalkWalker, and we looked at the frequency of uh, specific terms posted on the internet during uh, the 70 days uh, before the emergency COVID-19 declaration in each country and compare them with the frequency of the same terms posted during the 30 days after each country's emergency declaration. Word choice was based on the published US study Words were eliminated or frequencies were too low or a word lacked cultural relevance. In a few cases, culturally relevant substitutions were made. For example, tortilla for bread in Mexico. The collectivistic words, as you see in this result slide, the collectivistic words such as help and give rose significantly in all four countries. Words denoting subsistence activities also rose in all four countries. Mortality salience words rose in the United States and Indonesia, but not in Mexico and Japan. We think that the reason it didn't rise to a significant degree in Mexico is that mortality was already very salient in Mexican culture before COVID. Day of the Dead is arguably the most important national holiday. We think the reason it did not rise at all in Japan is a combination of two factors. Similar to Mexico, mortality was already very salient in Japanese culture before COVID. For example, Oban, a celebration dedicated to the dead, is a major holiday in Japan. And a second factor making mortality salience not rise in Japan was that there was actually no COVID-related mortality in Japan at the time of our study.
But one thing you may be thinking is about the paradox of going back to an earlier way of life during COVID, but at the same time becoming increasingly reliant on the internet. Indeed, I personally ordered supplies for my vegetable garden online, and our online data certainly indicated that the important shifts were to some extent actualized in virtual life on the internet. I would encapsulate this paradox by saying that the impulse to return to concerns, activities, and values found at a much earlier point in human history took place in a very different environment, notably an environment with sophisticated capacities for electronic communication. So we also explored how people were using this environment and its psychological effects. And this is the last study. So we included in our survey in the United States, the one I've told you about, some other questions I haven't told you about. Questions concerning shifts in electronic communication during COVID and implications for well being. It was the same survey participants, but different questions. So we asked whether video calling and phone and text were less frequent or stayed the same during COVID. We also, um, oh, in terms of results, re respondents reported that all three modes of communication had increased significantly with both family and friends, video calling, phone, and text. We also asked well-being questions, has satisfaction with life, positive emotions, and negative emotions increased, decreased, or stayed the same since the stay at home order. We found that increased communication with friends also increased satisfaction with life and positive emotions. So in other words, our regression analysis showed that increased levels of mediated communication with friends across all three modalities combined predicted increases in life satisfaction and increases in positive emotions during the pandemic. Increased communication with family did not show the same positive effect. But in short, increases in mediated communication were serving as a compensation when in-person interaction was not possible. And this compensatory effort had positive effects on people's sense of well-being and emotional state. Let me now summarize and draw some conclusions. This, this study summarizes the results of uh, the first two studies in the United States and the cross-cultural studies. In summary, all of the predictions concerning shifts in mortality salience, cultural values, adult behavior, and child learning environment were confirmed by the data with survey and online data providing complementary information both methodologically and substantively. Moreover, the overall hypothesis generated by my theory of social change, cultural evolution, and human development was strongly confirmed. As mortality increased in the pandemic and the social world shrunk to the household for many people, not only did the ecology move closer to that ecology characteristic of subsistence villages, but cultural values, behavior, and child learning environments move to adapt to these conditions. Collect, collect, oh, where am I? Collectivistic and subsistence values grew stronger. Subsistence activities became significantly more frequent. Authoritarian restrictions became more acceptable. Family members became more interdependent and parents increased their expectations for children to contribute to family maintenance. 
in all these ways, increased mortality and shrinking of the social world brought about the pan but brought about by the pandemic moved concerns, values, and behavior closer to a pattern char characterizing an earlier, more dangerous time in human history. And these, ha and these happened around the world. However, these rapid shifts at the beginning of the pandemic took place in a very different communication environment than was present in early human history. One with tremendous capacities for electronically mediated communication. In the last study I reported, we found that people use these capacities by increasing their use of phone texts and especially video calling, and then increased use of these modalities with friends predicted an increased sense of well-being and more positive emotions than before the pandemic. On the theoretical level, our replications across the globe suggest universal mechanisms of cultural and behavioral adaptation in response to the perception of mortal danger and the ecology of a very small scale social world. These mechanisms operated as predicted by my theory of social change, cultural evolution, and human development, thus providing suggestive evidence of the theory's universality. On the human level, I've shown you the silver lining of the COVID tragedy. Will these changes last? For the, for, for the survey study and the online study I presented, my answer is basically no. The shifts I've shown you in the United States and other countries are basically adaptations to conditions that made survival very salient and reduced people's social world to the family household. These adaptations happened very quickly when the pandemic started. As conditions changed back to how they were before, as COVID mortality rates decline and people expand, expand their social world back to its pre-COVID size, as has clearly begun to happen, values and behavior will adapt by going back also. However, other research suggests there may be some sensitive developmental periods for cultural learning between about nine years old and early adulthood. So those who have gone through the pandemic in that age range may in years to come show traces of the values and behaviors that emerged during the pandemic, even when conditions change. As survival concern wanes, and the social world expands, the rest of the population will probably change back to our pre-pandemic values, activities, and concerns. What will happen with mediated communication is still an open question. However, I think we can already see that we're ending up with a more hybrid communication world using mediated communication when it makes sense and using in-person communication when it makes sense. And now for my thank yous. This slide acknowledges all the people who participated in different ways in this research. Besides being of scientific value, I hope this research helps you to make sense out of your own experience during the pandemic. Thank you very much for listening and I look forward to the live discussions. <laughs>